Reformed tradition. Does anybody remember the name of it? That's right. Geneva gown, right? Geneva gown. And does anybody remember what what was what is the Geneva gown? What kind of robe is it? Well, that that's somewhat it's academic, right? It's a it's an academic gown. So this is the same gown that in the time period of the Reformation that, you know, let's say I was one of the ministers in Geneva. <coughs> During the week, oftentimes I would be in a college classroom or say like maybe in a, in a high school type, you know, classroom, and I would be lecturing to the students and I would be wearing my academic gown and the gown is designed to show whatever degree of academic achievement you have made. So if you had a bachelor's degree, you would have a robe that was um, somewhat plain, right? But it indicated that you'd achieved that degree. And then if you had a master's degree, it would be uh, probably just felt right down the middle like this with long sleeves. And then uh, at least that's one style of the master's you know, gowns and it would have long sleeves hanging off of it. And that would show another level of training and then Usually the panels on the arm, that's the, the um, insignia for the doctoral degree, right? And so like on my gown, the red piping, does anybody, anybody remember what the red piping is for? Theology, right? Right. So that red piping represents the school of theology. And so I graduated with a PhD from the school of theology, <laughs> right? And so when you look at a Geneva gown, it's saying to you something of how that minister was trained. And really, in many cases, if people are true to the Geneva gown tradition, it would tell you where they're trained. Because, see, like this was the colors of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary when I graduated from there. Okay? And um, some of the doctoral gowns, you had a choice. You could go with a black felt or you could go with a blue felt. So you'll see, like Southern Seminary doctoral graduates might have a blue felt. You know, D. J. D. James Kennedy. I don't know where he did his doctoral work, but if you ever watched him on television, he had a, he had his doctoral gown, and it was gray, if I remember yeah, uh, correctly. Gray and blue. Yeah, and so again, that would represent you know the school that he was trained at. So when you go into a, a reformed church, the minister is wearing the Geneva gown. Say, where was he trained? Um, what level of training has he had? And uh, that's kind of unique to reformed churches. If you go to say a Methodist church, they may be wearing a Geneva gown as well, but they would wear more of, their gowns are more representative of ecclesiastical offices. And if you go into the Episcopal church, the gowns are more representative of what that person's office is. Is the person a deacon? They'd have a certain gown. Is the person um, a pastor that have a certain gown is the person a bishop their gown would look different and so on and so forth kind of like representing the hierarchy of the the um, ecclesiastical offices if you will um, same that like in the Roman Catholic Church right um, the gowns change based on the office that the person is holding the emphasis of the reformed tradition is on the training of the minister right because we believe that uh, what really matters at the end of the day is the Word of God. And the minister's training is supposed to be in and around the Word of God, right? And so, just a reminder, spread the Word. There's only a few of us here tonight. So, you know, remind people what the Geneva gown is and what it isn't, right? It's not really what we call ecclesiastical vestments, right? Vestments more or less represent um, office, status of office, whereas the Geneva gown, it does speak of a person's ordination to the office, but it, it, more, it puts more emphasis on what was their training, right? We are to rightly handle the word of God. And so that's why we want our ministers trained. If you look at our book of church order, it says, 
that a person has to have what we we summarize it by saying a person has to have a master of divinity or equivalent to be a minister in the PCA and but but if you look at the book of church order it actually lays out the various disciplines that our ministers have to be trained in right and so then we have examinations that match those qualifications to see that the men are properly trained and didn't somebody didn't just check the box for them idea okay all right now to the shorter catechism that was a little bit that I, I consider that somewhat catechetical training because it does speak a little bit as to why we do certain things okay all right so coming to uh, the shorter catechism let's look at uh, question uh, let me back it up here 23. Okay, I'm going to look at question 23. And then we're going to jump forward to where we are today on question 27. What offices doth Christ execute as our Redeemer? Christ as our Redeemer executeth the office of a prophet, of a priest, and of a king, both in his estate of humiliation and and exaltation. Okay, so in the last few weeks, we've been unpacking each of those offices, prophet, priest, and king. Now, with question 27, we're going to unpack a bit of what it means for Christ to, to be in a state of humiliation. Okay, so that brings us to question 27. That's what's printed in your order of worship here. So, wherein did Christ's humiliation consist? Christ's humiliation consisted in his being born, and that in a low condition, made under the law, undergoing the miseries of this life, the wrath of God, and the cursed death of the cross, in being buried and continuing under the power of death, for a time. Very good. So, we're going to unpack some of that, not every phrase of that, but unpack some of that in the message. Let's, let's go over that one more time, and then we'll take some time to uh, reflect on that truth as we prepare for worship this evening, okay? Number 27, wherein did Christ's humiliation consist? Christ's humiliation consisted in his being born, and that in a low condition, made under the law, undergoing the miseries of this life, the wrath of God, and the cursed death of the cross, in being buried and continuing under the power of death for a time. Let's stand together as we hear the call to worship. The Lord calls us to worship here from 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Almighty God, our Savior, your grace alone stirs our heart to reverence and adoration. 
You who are the first and best of beings made yourself low for our salvation. You who knew no sin became sin for us. You who are full of blessedness became a curse for us. You who are rich beyond all splendor became poor for us. You did all for us so that we might be rich toward God. May you enrich us now with the fullness of thy spirit that we may return thanks and praise to you for who you are, the only true and living God, and for what great things you have done. Amen. We'll begin with um, a hymn of the humiliation of Jesus Christ in being born and that in a low condition. Hymn number 213, What Child Is This? What child is this who laid to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping? Whom angels greet with anthem sweet while shepherds watch our keeping? seated. So uh, can any of the children tell me what it means that he was, um, why lies he in such mean estate? What is a mean estate? Poor conditions. conditions. There you go. Good job. Poor conditions. So we come now to the reading of God's law. From Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 17, let's read aloud together and uh, hear and be humbled by the perfection of God's law. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, 
which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Amen. Let's take a moment to um, confess our own sins before the Lord, and then we'll join together in this corporate confession of sin that is drawn from Psalm 130. Let's pray together. Out of the depths I cry to thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let thy ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If thou, O Lord, shouldst mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with thee, that thou mayest be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word, I hope, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, from Isaiah 53, we have these words of assurance of our pardon. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Our next hymn uh, turns our attention to that very reality as another aspect of the humiliation of Jesus Christ, his humiliation in dying a cursed death, the death of the cross. O sacred head, now wounded with grief and shame weighed down, now scornfully surrounded with thorns, thine only crown. O sacred head, what glory, what bliss till now was thine, yet though despised in glory, I joy to call thee mine. Let's stand and sing together. <clears throat> o sacred head now wounded with grief. 
grief and shame weighed down, now scornfully surrounded with thorns thine only crown. O sacred head, what glory, what bliss till now was thine, yet though despised and This opportunity to focus on the gratitude which wells up in our heart for our great God. And so let's pray now this prayer of thanksgiving. Oh. Father, you are our hope, our comfort, our strength. You are our all in all. In you, our soul rejoices. You, O oh Lord, are the creator and the governor of the world. And you have abundantly provided for the various needs of your creatures, and they are too many to count. We thank you that even while we reside in a burdensome world filled with sin and death, you have not left us without hope. We have an everlasting hope. We praise and thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ, your Son, by whose gospel life and immortality are brought to light. We thank you that we are fully instructed in all those things which concern our salvation. We thank you for the pardon of sin through the gift of faith in a Redeemer and for the guidance of your providence through your Holy Spirit. You have given us exceedingly great and precious promises and have sealed them in our Savior's blood. You have confirmed these promises by his resurrection and ascension. Thank you for giving us the joy and happiness of knowing these truths. We thank you for your written word and for the other means of grace which you have entrusted to us. May our hearts overflow with gratitude and love, and may we be used in mighty ways to share the radiance of your glorious and wonderful grace. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. We have another hymn here of the humiliation of Christ, and it uh, speaks specifically of the impact that it has on us. As Isaac Watts writes here of surveying the wondrous cross, where he considers the humiliation of the Lord Jesus Christ, um, it awakens um, something in him, right? Adoration 
in him for the Lord Jesus Christ and changes him. And we're going to see that in just a moment when we turn to uh, Philippians 2, that uh, the humiliation of Christ should have uh, an impact on us as we are called to have that mind in us that was in him when he humbled himself. So let's stand once again and sing together hymn number 252, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss, and poor contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to His blood. See from His head his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did there such love and sorrow meet? Or thorns come? So rich a crown Were the whole realm of nature mine That were a present far too small Love so Amazing, so divine, demons my soul, my life, my all. Amen. Uh, if you would remain standing, I invite you to turn in your Bibles with me to the book of Philippians. In chapter 2, we're going to look at verses 5 through 8 this evening. And uh, let's once again turn to the Lord in prayer to ask for his help. Father, great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness, that God was manifest in the flesh. The how and the why of the incarnation are profound. We know so little of this grace. And yet we desire to know more. Teach us, Lord, so that we would worship you and be conformed to the Lord Jesus as we grow in the knowledge of this grace. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Philippians chapter 2, beginning at verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Thus far the reading of God's holy word, and may God add his blessing to the reading of his word. 
Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So what is the difference between humility and humiliation? Humility is a personal quality in which one willingly lowers himself for the benefit of another. Humiliation refers to someone being made low by another. Humility is usually exercised with dignity, while the goal of humiliation is indignity. A humble person might willingly undertake or might willingly take the uncomfortable seat to give another person the comfortable seat. Whereas a bully might try to humiliate someone by taking his seat and making him sit at another table. In both cases, a person gives up a seat, right? But in one, in humility, gives it up in love for another. But in, in the other, the seat is taken in order to belittle or, or make the other person feel low for having to get up and move at their behest. Now, the Shorter Catechism 27 speaks here of Christ's humiliation, the indignity that he suffered as our Redeemer. But Philippians 2 speaks of Jesus humbling himself. In other words, the very things, or at least some of the very things, that the Catechism lists as indignities that Christ suffered are the things that Philippians 2 says he willingly undertook. And so these two concepts of humility and humiliation are joined together in the person and work of Jesus Christ. This joining of humility and humiliation is often expressed by theologians when referring to Christ's work at the cross as his passive obedience. He did not spit in his own face. He did not punch himself or press the crown of thorns into his head. He did not whip himself with a cat of nine tails or nail his hands and feet to the cross. All these indignities were done to him by his enemies. He was passive. And yet this was not merely the work of his enemies. For enduring these indignities and sufferings was a willing choice that he could have ended at any moment. His enemies humiliated him. That was their goal. But he humbled himself to suffer these things for our salvation. Paul does not exhort the Philippians to be humiliated. He doesn't want them to seek persecution. But Paul does exhort the Philippian Christians to practice humility toward each other, putting the interests of others ahead of their own, as he would say earlier in this chapter, by exercising the mind of Christ as the exemplar of humility. Because Christ humbled himself to be the servant, we who are in Christ can also practice humility. And so let's look here at how Christ humbled himself for our salvation. The first thing that, that becomes clear as we start with verse 6 is that being equal with God, he became the likeness of men. Here the language of form, he was in the form of God, being in the form of God, that is, the expression of the very nature or essence of the reality of the thing. That's what this word morphe form means. He, he's the 
expression of the nature or essence of the reality of God. When Jesus then took the form, same word that's used of he being in the form of God, when he takes the form of a servant, right, he's not pretending to be a servant. Jesus was a servant. He's, he's the epitome of what a servant is. Right? So he's not pretending to be God. He is God. Right? And when he took the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men, he didn't cease to be God. He didn't transform, as we might, some people might mistakenly think of the incarnation. He didn't transform from being God to now being man. The incarnation did not involve a subtraction of deity, but the incarnation was an addition of humanity, an addition of a human nature to his divine person. So Jesus Christ has two distinct natures, the human and the divine, united in one person, the Lord Jesus Christ. In the definition of Chalcedon, the, uh, we use these um, phrases to help us rightly confess the union of the human and the divine natures in Christ. We use the words without separation, without division, but also without confusion and without change. So we cannot separate now the human and the divine in Jesus. We cannot divide between them. There is such a union of them. Neither are they confused. That is, they're not mixed. There's not a mixture. There's a union, but not a mixture of the divine and human. That means that there is also no change in either nature. The human nature does not change due to its union with the divine nature, and the divine nature does not change due to its union with the human nature. This is what theologians would call, um, if, if we believed that there was this change that came or confusion of these two natures, we'd wind up with what theologians call the th a third thing. Right? That is neither human nor divine, but is some third thing. And as we understand the purpose of the incarnation, that would not serve our salvation. Because we are human beings. And so we need a human being to come and suffer the penalty for our sins in our place. Not an angel. Right? Not some um, uh, demigod. Right? Like Hercules or something like that. No. We need a man, a true man, a real man, 100% man. But we also need one who is God in order to satisfy that, that justice for us as God's people. God alone, all throughout the Old Testament, God alone is the Savior of his people and no other, right? He brooks no rivals. And so we need one who is fully God and one who is fully human, not one who is some mixture of the two and then is a third thing. And so this, this is what Christ does in the incarnation. He who is the very form of God became the form of a servant, being made in the likeness of men. Like men, he was then born in a low condition. Now children, where was Jesus born? All right, I heard two answers, Bethlehem and stable, right. Okay, so why was Jesus born in a stable? Were most babies born in stables back then? Is that just a normal thing that babies in the ancient world were born in stables? Because all the other Very good. All, all of the other lodgings in Bethlehem were full. And so Mary and Joseph were basically forced to um, turn the baggage area where people's luggage and people's animals were stored uh, into a maternity ward. Right? 
Where was Jesus brought up? Galilee. Galilee is good. Can we get it more narrowed down than Galilee? Was he, was he born in Sepphoris? Nazareth. Nazareth. There you go. And um, what was Nazareth famous for? <laughs> Nothing, exactly. <laughs> the place where Jesus was raised. Do you remember one of Jesus' disciples when he heard that... Uh, Jesus was from Nazareth. Do you remember what he said? Can, yeah, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? I don't think that it meant that Nazareth was notorious for wickedness. I think it meant that Nazareth, well, it's just a sleepy little town where nothing goes on, right? Um, and so Jesus was born in a stable, and he was brought up in Nazareth, um, not in a palace, not in, the, not in the hustle and bustle of the big city of Jerusalem, it, it, but rather in a kind of obscurity, right? In a low condition. He was like men in being born in, in a low condition and, and, and even um, identifying not only with men generally, but even maybe with the lowest of men, those who are born in a low condition. He is like men also in suffering the miseries of this life. As we um, read this morning from Hebrews 4, remember he was tempted in all ways like as we are, yet without sin. So all, all of the trials that, that you face in life, Jesus faced them. He hungered. The Bible tells us he thirsted. He suffered mental and emotional anguish. Remember Luke tells us that he was in anguish in the Garden of Gethsemane and was like sweating drops of blood. He suffered social shame from his family and from religious authorities. Do you remember when his family came to take him home because they said he was mad? That is, he was out of his mind? This is Mary and his brothers. You guys, gentle Mary. <laughs> he wept at the tomb of a friend. You ever, you ever wept at the, at the graveside of a friend? Jesus wept at the tomb of a friend. He was betrayed by one who called himself his friend. He was forsaken by his friends. He was rejected by his nation. He was falsely accused and he was unjustly condemned. He suffered all the miseries of this life. In fact, I feel quite blessed when I consider my own life next to Jesus' life. I mean, I wasn't raised in a palace either, but I certainly wasn't born in a stable. Right? Maybe I would take Nazareth over Baltimore, but you know. But Jesus suffered. I don't know too many days when in my life when I could say I was genuinely hungry. I don't know uh, too many times when I could say that I really was so thirsty that I would have taken sour wine on a sponge. Jesus did not pass through this world indifferent to its fallen condition. He willingly chose the path of suffering for the salvation of his people. And so Paul, in a sense, is giving us here an argument from um, the greater to the lesser, right? If God humbled himself by taking our human nature in a fallen world, how much more ought we who are human to humble ourselves to identify with those who suffer the miseries of this life? More than us, maybe. How much more ought we to humble ourselves? We have far less to go to humble ourselves, to serve our fellow man than what Jesus did in humbling himself to come as God to become a man.
being equal with God, he became the likeness of men. But then Paul goes on to say, being then the perfect man, he became obedient unto a cursed death. Here he uh, refers in verse 8, being found in fashion as a man. The, the Greek term schema is humanity um, in its observable Nature and how Jesus' humanity was observable. You, people could witness his life, and those who witnessed his life testified that he was tempted in all ways like as we are, and yet without sin, that he rendered a perfect obedience to God in his humanity. I don't know that I've ever really uh, given it enough thought, enough meditation to try to take in what it would be like to witness a human being in perfect obedience to God, perfect obedience to God. I mean, we've all, as members of the church in the covenant community, we've all seen partial obedience to God. We've all seen the desire of obedience to God and, and so forth. And that in itself is a beautiful thing and a contrast to what we know of the wickedness of the human heart, right? Just to witness the godliness of our uh, fellow saints. But imagine perfect obedience. That's what Jesus demonstrated in, as he was in, the, in fashion as a man. And in that fashion, as the, the perfect, obedient son, he becomes obedient unto death. And, and we read the Gospels and we see that Jesus' obedience unto death is not some a stoic obedience, right? It's not some uh, passionless obedience where he's just resigned himself to the fate of suffering or resigned himself to the fate of a cursed death but rather we see one whose joy was set before him to endure the cross despising the shame not a stoic not spock like as he faces the, but despising the shame he endured the cross Full of pathos and with an eye to that joy. We hear Jesus pray in the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Right? But, but Jesus doesn't look on the cross as some trifling thing. He doesn't look on sin-bearing judgment as some trifling thing that he just traipses over to to get it over with. No, it, it's a terrible burden that he bears. Even in the thought, even in the thought of it. And yet he yields himself in obedience to the Father's will. He says to his disciples in John 12 that his soul is in great heaviness. He's greatly distressed. He's deeply disturbed in his soul as he contemplates the cross. Paul in um, Galatians chapter 3 speaks uh, further of the cursed nature of this death. It was no accident that Jesus died on the cross. This was designed by God so that it would be a specifically cursed death because he was there becoming a curse for us so that we would be delivered from the curse and receive the blessing of God. This Galatians 3, verses 10 through 14, it says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, 
Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. So anybody here kept God's law perfectly? Right. None of us have. And Paul says that means that we're all under the curse for breaking God's law. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, that is, those who want to be justified on the basis of the law, but that's not faith. That's trying to earn your salvation by works. But the man that doeth them shall live in them. So that's the wretched human condition for every single person in Adam. Right? Under the curse of the law, unable to bring ourselves out from under that curse. There's nothing we can do. It, it's all vanity, striving against the wind to try to be justified on the basis of the law. That's where we all were until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 13 then says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Deuteronomy 21. Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. And he did that, verse 14 says, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. He became a curse so that we might receive the blessing. Right? That's the humility and the humiliation of the Lord Jesus Christ, the cursed death of the cross. Saving faith then trusts in Christ's death as what it is presented here, a penal substitution. That is, he took the penalty of our sins in our place. Saving faith trusts in the death of Jesus Christ as such, right? Not just as a moral example that I want to follow and love the way Jesus loved. That's good. We do want to follow Jesus' example, and we do want to love the way Jesus loved. We don't. So if that was the path of salvation, we'd all still be lost. That's not the path of salvation, though, is it? The path of salvation is trusting in Jesus Christ as a substitute for our um, death. Substituting the death, substituting for us in the death we deserve. Saving faith trusts in Christ's love that is demonstrated at the cross. God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And saving faith must lay hold of the love of God that's displayed in the cross. That's trusting in his grace, God's grace, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Saving faith, it, it has to be a, um, a genuine miracle of God. Because when we recognize our wretchedness and our sinfulness and the curse that we rightly deserve, then we might find it incredible, literally incredible, that God would love me. Right? What, what could possibly persuade me that God would love me? And I know a lot of people in this world go around thinking that, of course, God ought to love them, Right? And why wouldn't God love me? But that they haven't discovered the sinfulness of their sin. That's why they think that way. But for those who have discovered just how wretched they are, we go, how could God love me? Why would God love me? There's no explanation for why he should love me. And so God says, I know that you, are, you, you search high and low and you try to re, you know, reach for some reason why I love you. And you may never discover it, but I give you this. I give you my son on the cross as the demonstration of my love for you. And saving faith trusts in Christ's love demonstrated at the cross. And then Paul's application here in Philippians 2. Saving faith trusts in Christ's pattern of humble obedience. 
I mean, many people have absolutely rejected what Paul calls for here. I've seen spouses, husbands and wives, who absolutely reject this. They won't do it even with one another. Even in the marital relationship, they, they, they will not humble themselves to put the interests of the other one ahead of the, their own interests. They won't do it. Even, even husband and wife. Now, if you, if you see that in marital relationships, imagine how that looks in the workplace Imagine how that looks in, in so many other uh, relationships that we have with people where you know, people are willing to go just so far in rendering service to another person. Most people don't go beyond where it's convenient, right? As long as it's convenient, I'll put myself out there. Most of us won't even go to the place of inconvenience. And here Paul is saying, no, I want you... To put the interests of the other person ahead of your own interests. Well, how are we going to do that? Well, he says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So, as we have trusted in the death of Christ as penal substitution, as we have trusted in Christ's death as the demonstration of the Father's love for us, we can also trust that the pattern that he followed, the pattern that he laid out for us, is also the pattern for our lives. Right? So it doesn't mean that serving other people is going to be easy. Jesus' life wasn't easy. Right? But that humility, humbling himself, as we'll see next week with question 28, right? that's, that's the path to being exalted. Right, and enjoying the glory of the resurrection and the glory of his ascension and the glory of being at the Father's right hand and dwelling forever in the Father's house. And so you say, yeah, you know what? Humbling myself the way that Jesus did, that's a terrifying thing. The people are wicked people. And if we humble ourselves, we're probably going to get hurt. Jesus got hurt. But... We trust. We trust, right? Just like we trust in his death for our sins, we trust in his love for us, we trust in the pattern that he laid out for us so that we, his mind is in us to humble ourselves. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Almighty God, we do pray that you would um, conform us to your, Lord, your, your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. As you have given us the mind of Christ, we pray that more and more we would um, see that manifest in our obedience to you, in our service to one another, in our service to others. Lord, help us to be able to put uh, the sin of pride and arrogance to death as we humble ourselves before the feet of our Lord Jesus Christ, um, who humbled himself to redeem us. We ask in his name. Amen. Well, our closing hymn, our hymn of response, already anticipates where Paul goes in Philippians 2, from his humiliation to his exaltation. And it's the head that once was crowned with thorns, right? It's not crowned with thorns now. The head that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now. A royal diadem adorns the mighty victor's brow. And so let's stand and sing this together. Hymn number 298. Wow. that once
once was crowned with thorns, is crowned with glory now. Of royal diadem adorns the mighty victor's brow. The highest place that heaven affords is his, is his by right. The King of kings and Lord of lords and hands eternal light. The joy of all who dwell above, the joy of all below. To him we manifest his love and grants his name to know. To them the cross with all its shame, with all its grace is given. Their name, an everlasting name, their joy, the joy of heaven. They suffer with their Lord below, they reign with him above. Their profit and their joy to know the mystery of his love. The cross he bore is life and health, no shame and death to him. His people's hope, his people's wealth, their everlasting theme. Amen. <clears throat> and now receive the benediction of the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.